Good evening. Welcome to the Cypress House for the launch of the poetry collection Yorgos Christodoulidis, Selected Poems, 1996-2021. Um, the launch today will combine both live and recorded readings and presentations. And at the end, you will be able to meet and chat with the poet, the translator. And of course, uh, you can get your own copy of the book. But firstly, I would like to invite His Excellency, the High Commissioner of Cyprus, Mr. Andreas Kakuris, for his welcoming note. Thank you, uh, Marios. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and, and many thanks to all of you for being here tonight, and a warm welcome to Cyprus House. Uh, we're always so delighted to offer these premises to cultural exchange activities and the promotion of cultural relations between Cyprus and the UK, especially among the diverse international community based here in London. And uh, Cyprus, despite its small size, has given birth to many outstanding individuals in the areas of poetry, philosophy and generally literature ever since ancient times. Cyprus's unique landscape, diverse culture, dynamic communities and the indelible footprints of history have inspired generations of poets and novelists both home and abroad. And on this occasion we are delighted to host an evening dedicated to contemporary Cypriot poet Yorgos Kistoglidis. We do so on the occasion of the launch of the poetry collection Yorgos Kistoglidis Selected Poems 1996 2021, translated to the English language from the original Greek and with an introduction by Despina Birgeti. Yorgos is amongst Cyprus's most prominent contemporary authors. It's actually, Yorgos, wonderful to see you again after 16, 17 years. Uh, he's been presented with the Cyprus State Poetry Award twice, and he has seen his work published in single volumes in Bulgarian, French, German, Serbian, and most recently in English. He is also featured in international anthologies, literary, literary journals, and at poetry festivals across the world. I'd like to firstly thank the author Yorgos and the translator Despina Birgeti for traveling all the way from Cyprus to be with us this evening at this presentation and to say what a pleasure and delight it is to have both you with us and also to have Aris with us this evening. <laughs> Special thanks also to Dr. Michael Barasco, Senior Teaching Fellow in the Centre for Languages, Culture and Communication at Imperial College London, who will guide us through the fascinating literary pathways of Yorgos's poetry, as well as to my own cultural counsellor, I think everybody knows him, Marios Psaras, for organising the event. I understand that we're also in for a treat with some visual presentations of the poems. With this, I'd like again to extend, extend a heartfelt best wishes to all for an enjoyable evening into the literary world of Yorgos Christodoulides. Thank you and welcome again to Cyprus House and enjoy the evening. Thank you, Your Excellency. So, this is the book. And flicking through the pages of this poetry collection, I stopped halfway, noticing a title both mysterious and confident, Diligently Erasing Traces. Diligently Erasing Traces. We will soon say goodbye to yet another summer, swing the last grains of sand off our smooth bodies. One grain will be lost deep in the labyrinth of the ear, it might even be buried with us. We'll save a slice of shining sun in an airtight poem to be read by the blind and to glare like a crisp torch in the night. Now the nights are many. We'll hide a suspicion of freshness under the tongue. Over time, it will spill across the palate and a future kiss will taste like the sea. We'll make an unexpected love disappear as the magician swiftly makes the startled rabbit disappear by labelling it never happened. Then nobody will be able to steal anything from us since we'll have nothing other to do than take stock of how another summer grazed against us. Many times the unsung heroes of such publications are the translators. 
Vespina Birchetti is one of the busiest translators in Cyprus, at least in terms of literature, as I know she has worked with some of the most important contemporary Cypriot authors. Vespina has studied translation, literature, and theater studies in Greece and Cyprus, and she works as a literary translator between Greek, English, and French. She's also the author of a novel published in Athens, 1999, and two stage plays, Sommerfagl, Fugel, okay, um, and Anesthesia. During the 2021 theatrical season, she served as juror for the Cyprus Theatre Awards. Let's be now. Let me take you a few years back to the 15th century. In Cyprus, during Frankish rule, when not many people knew how to read and write, storytellers visited villages and told crusader stories to adventure Thursday crowds. The stories were usually based on the tradition of the Chronicle, which is an account of historical events. However, the main aim of storytellers was not to tell the historical truth, but rather to entertain. Their stories were open-ended and could be readjusted in tune with the crowd's reactions. I have leaned upon the fluidity of storytelling in order to draw a parallel with the literary translator's task. Storytelling in Cyprus during Frankish rule entailed the subjective treatment of the original material, whereby facts and fiction blurred to best serve the performative effect of a story. Storytellers interpreted old stories through the lens of their contemporary audience and relate them in an engaging manner, very much like translators do, hopefully not so freely. Nevertheless, the practice of translation is a highly personal, creative process. And it is something we all do, whether consciously or unconsciously. In our daily exchanges, don't we construe or misconstrue events, occurrences and feelings and then retell them to someone else? Aren't we all translators of our own and of others' experiences? If so, wouldn't it be pointless and rather pretentious on behalf of writers and translators to lay claim to an unchanging narrative or to suppose there is always a fixed meaning to be communicated within the same language or across different languages. The very notion of translation entails movement, and movement entails shift and unsettlement. To convey a varied assemblage of verbal and pictorial signs into another system is an act of transformation that should not be defined by either loss or gain, but by a new multi-layered reception. When you leave one place to go to another, you forgo the physical form of the experience that sustained you there, but are you ever entirely rid of it? I think we all carry traces of where, how, and who we used to be, and these traces are embedded in our present and future versions. They are ensconced within the way we speak and write, especially if we write or translate poetry. We make use of the fascinating potential of rhetorical devices in order to call attention to the polysemy of our speech, to the different aspects of our intention to communicate with others. Let them know who we are and what we've been through so far, but not in so many words. In 2017, I had the great pleasure of translating a Cypriot poet who was born and raised in London and is a native speaker of English. His name is George Tadios. His mother tongue, in the sense of the language of his mother, is Cypriot Greek. Therefore, when he wrote the collection Buttoned Up Shapes, a tribute to the first Cypriot immigrants to London in the 1930s, George, among other things, alluded to the turmoil of spatial, verbal, and emotional shift. He wrote well-crafted, evocative, not too explicit English verses, imbued, however, with an underlayer of his Cypriot Greek origins. In fear of sounding too vague, I have to tell you that the English original of the poet George Tadios wondrously contained its Greek translation. For instance, the poem Alien Light, about a young man, Xenophon, 
who falls in love with his best friend's wife and derided by friends and family loses his mind is in fact a metaphor for the man's name. Xenophon, Xenophon, in ancient Greek, means strange voice. In its Cypriot Greek variation, Xenophos, signifies alien light. We speak with metaphors to appeal to the listener's emotion or sense of logic. We use parallels to expand our story. We repeat to make a point. We compare to clarify. Like storytellers, we slip excerpts in and out of our narratives in order to connect more deeply. And this we do as human beings, quite conscious of our ephemeral nature, but also mercifully aware of the longevity of art. Our poems and our translated poems will be here long after we are not. They might even thrive in our absence. To try and isolate them within a fixed framework of authorial intention or translational fidelity would be to disregard the poem's rough core of embers that fan into flame each time it crosses over to a new system of focal symbols, allied with enriching potentialities. These 100 poems we have selected from a body of work spanning 25 years have been translated into English in order to expose the worldview of Yorgos Christodoulidis, not just his work. Everything I have proposed above, my view of the translational process and my practice of it, would not have applied as easily as I suggest had it not been for this particular poetry and this particular poet. That he has given me the absolute freedom to interpret his work and reproduce it, tinted with hues of my choosing, is a privilege I will forever hold dear to my heart, both his, as his translator and as his wife of 25 years. Thank you. That was really beautiful. Thank you very much, Despina. And I need the text, it's amazing. It may be seen as an endearing green for the ephemeral nature of youth and love and their indelible traces upon the human body. Through the Purple Tattoos, recited by James McKay, Assistant Professor at the European University, Cyprus. My name is James McKay. I'm an Assistant Professor of British and American Literatures at European University, Cyprus, and it is my honour to read from Yorgos Christodoulidis' selected poems. Through the Purple Tattoos Mothers with purple tattoos on their calves come and go by the pitch, picking grapes and picking up their children. They look merrily forlorn. Their tattoos are seals to certify they didn't always belong. When love bargained with freedom, someone had a clever idea to be engraved with a stylus. Tattoos are a challenge. Look, there is a time when I only wanted to be. Now I have what I never thought I'd seek, but sometimes I'm not sure about exactly what I want. They say the owl was a baker's daughter. Through the hollow bone of dusk, I see the rotten marrow of the world flowing like a quiet river, drying up as it slides towards the future's empty repositories. And I'm positive that years ago, by the edge of an ocean, these mothers made love behind the tamarisks in an endless August, nailed firmly to its days, until the nails erupted and leaves soaked the hours. And then these same days peered across the breadth of the water for anything that seemed endless and scorned redemption because it didn't understand, like a myopic insect wallowing in mud. If it could trust a human being, it would confide its awe for this year's flurry of flora that will eventually feed on its manure. Now, I'm getting a tattoo that says, never ends. It's my first and I smile discreetly with coyness and feeble caution. And we have another video poem, Smithereens, a poem that pretty much sums up Yorgos worldview that the world is made up of shards feigning unity. 
these notes are by Despina, <laughs> just to clarify. So it's, it, I guess it's, it's your own interpretation. Yes, definitely, yes. It can, it can be seen any other way you like. Yeah, of course. Smithereens. In the moment when the cup falls to the floor and smashes into a hundred shards, you realise the value of wholeness. That what we call entire is on the verge of smashing. It is that which resists falling and breaking into one hundred shards, that which persistently withholds the sum of its parts, determined not to let on that it is as brittle as the cup. It is exactly that, one hundred shards, clinging firmly to each other to feign unity. Time now to hand over to Dr. Michael Barasco, Senior Teaching Fellow in the Centre for Languages, Culture and Communication at Imperial College London, specialising in art history. Michael has studied in Leeds and gained his doctorate in art history at the University of Nottingham. He has taught in various British universities for the past 30 years. He is the author of books and articles on art history, focusing mainly on modernist art and has reviewed exhibitions for BBC Radio 4's Front Row programme. He has written for newspapers and magazines including The Guardian and The Spectator. Dr. Michael Paraskos. Thank you very much. I'm going to begin by again reading the poem Smithereens. Smithereens. In the moment when the cup falls to the floor and smashes into a hundred shards, you realise the value of wholeness. That, what we call entire, is on the verge of smashing. It is that which resists falling and breaking into 100 shards, that which persistently withholds the sum of its parts, determined not to let on that it is as brittle as a cup. It is exactly that, 100 shards clinging firmly to each other to feign unity. I must admit I've become very fond of that poem, but I really wanted to begin by reading it because... I think any talk on a poet should start with the poet. Or should I say, should I say where to put my paper? <laughs> <laughs> should I say, should start with the poetry. Doing that places the poetry at the heart of whatever the commentator, in this case me, is likely to say next. And it reminds us that we're talking about a work of art that is or should be complete and imminent. It is its own interpretation. That's not to say I'm not honoured to have been asked to add my commentary to Yoyos' work. I spend my life as an art historian adding my commentary to other people's work, even though I know it often doesn't need it. Yet when Despina asked me to speak tonight, I was reluctant. I don't read Greek, I told her. But that's all right, she said. It's a translation. But I'm an art historian, I said, not a literary critic. But that's all right, she said. We don't want a literary critic. I think your words were, we don't like literary critics. <laughs> but I'm probably going to say something rude and offend everyone, I said. But that's all right, said Despina. We want you to be rude and offend everybody. You didn't say that. OK, I made that last bit up. <laughs> Despina did not say that. But I do suspect that what I'm about to say might offend some people. But if that's the case, then I think it's probably the sort of people who deserve to be offended. So here goes. The real reason I was reluctant was not any of the, of the excuses I gave to Despina when she asked me to speak tonight. The reason is that as a member of what is rather euphemistically called the Cypriot, or sometimes Greek if you prefer, diaspora, I do have a difficult relationship with Cyprus. I do not always like the place. To be honest with you, it has never felt welcoming to me in the way it sometimes likes to portray itself. I accept that other people might have different experiences to mine, but I do not feel Cyprus is welcoming for so-called second-generation Cypriots like me. We're not Cypriot enough, not Greek enough, not anything. We are, in the sense, some of the hundreds of shards who do not cling firmly to the whole but the whole doesn't seem to care. Even as I walked into the graveyard in the village near Larnaca when we were burying my father following his death in 2014, someone thought it appropriate to berate me for not being a proper Greek. 
not being fully Greek. What a nasty little shit you are, I thought. And so much for being part of the global Cypriot family. It was then I decided not to pretend to be a Cypriot anymore, let alone Greek. It's easier to deny it outright, although my name sometimes makes that difficult. The Coast Guardsman on his return. When I discovered the existence of language, I began to learn beautiful words. I learned quite a lot, but they seemed inapplicable. The people I found worthy were much fewer than the beautiful words. The redundant ones I kept within poems as a collector keeps pressed carnations within cardboard boxes, or the Coast Guardsman, on his return at night, entombs a shard of glow from the lighthouse inside of him to light up in good time. So why should I want to speak about a book of Cypriot poetry? Well, perhaps because whether you like it or not, or I like it or not, I am a Cypriot. I am a shard from that pot. In fact, I must be a Cypriot because I have a piece of paper in my wallet that says I am. I might not fit everyone's definition of a Cypriot, maybe not your definition of a Cypriot, a Greek, a Greek Cypriot, but so what? Do you really think you matter so much? And so when it comes to Yoyos' poetry, what I'd say is when it becomes available to me and thousands of people like me, as in Vespina's translation, maybe I do have something to say about it. In fact, maybe as a translation, it speaks more to me and the thousands of people like me, the second and third generation Cypriots, the diaspora. We are, after all, each of us, a kind of translated poem. But then the question is, what does it say to us? Well, and this is important, I can only speak for myself. A short while before the COVID pandemic, I was asked to speak at another book launch held at Leeds University for a newly published volume of poetry, that time by the English poet Martin Bell. I say by Martin Bell, but in fact, it was also a collection of translations made by Bell of the work of the French surrealist poet Robert Desnos. Bell died in 1978 and has been somewhat unjustly forgotten in the decades since. I was asked to speak because Bell had been a good friend of my father and they'd travelled together to Cyprus in 1968 when my father was laying groundwork for establishing the first art school in Cyprus, the Cyprus College of Art. Unfortunately, Bell was a notorious alcoholic and his drunken antics did not go down well in the, the very conservative world of late 1960s Cyprus. This trip was recorded by my father in a diary, and it was part of that diary that I read out. I must admit, I felt bad about it afterwards. I realised that what was intended as a light-hearted anecdote about Bell's drunkenness on an unsuccessful trip to see the then British Home Secretary, Roy Jenkins, who was holidaying in Kyrenia, might in fact have been a painful recollection of Bell's alcoholism for his family in the audience. However, my point in mentioning this now is not to seek absolution for my unintended sin, but to bring Bell's Cyprus poetry into the fray. Despite his alcoholism, Bell still wrote very good poetry, including some astonishing poems written whilst in Cyprus. They're different to his other poetry, and I suppose my father would have said they have spirit of place. We might like to think of them as somehow capturing the Cyprus that existed then, a very different island, and in many ways inhabited by a very different people to the Cyprus that exists now. Those Cypriots would be as alien to modern Cyprus as I am. But I don't think it's quite adequate to think of Bell's po uh, when think I don't think that is quite adequate when thinking of Bell's poetry. I don't think he did capture Cyprus like some sapient literary camera. I think he captured himself in Cyprus in a brief and specific moment in time. His poems do not look outward, recording a scene accurately, they look inward. And we see in them the experience of being tra trapped perpetually somewhere between drunkenness and hungover in that hot, sultry summer of 68 in the Eastern Mediterranean. Rather than capture a moment then, I think they represent a moment of placement. Or if you want to sound a bit more intellectual, a moment of emplacement. There's a kind of emplacement in Giorgio's poetry too. It's, it is also often set in Cyprus, and aspects of that Cyprus are recognisable to me. But still, it is different. It has to be. We may share common traits, the things that make us human, and we share a great deal of common culture, 
the things that make us social. But the experience of our bodies in time and space is surely unique to every one of us. Incarnations of the watermelon seller. He sells watermelons in front of the bus stop. In his past life, he too sold watermelons, though because in the 17th century there were no buses, he sold them next to horse and donkey dung at the crossroads of the dirt tracks that joined the pastures. One time, he, he brought a juicy watermelon to the court of the Regina. Didn't win her favour. He suspects that in his next life too, he'll be selling watermelons, and he'd like to be younger, less hunched, and better attired. Passing by my flying car, I'll see him and write the same poem. I wonder whether Yoyos would write the same poem. A different body in a different time and space, you see. It wouldn't quite be the same. The emplacement would be different. Nonetheless, I've come to like that poem very much. Seeing the watermelon sellers all over Cyprus in the early summer, sitting by in every lay-by and every road crossing, with their gr giant green stripy fruit piled high on the backs of pickup trucks, one often cut open to reveal the shocking red flesh, crass, vulgar, and yet delicious, is like a throwback to a Cyprus where these transient street hawkers might have been joined by a pastalaki seller, a gupes hawker, or a mahalapi peddler. Of course, they have largely gone, so only the watermelon sellers remain. But I'm not being nostalgic and lamenting their loss. I just recognize in it an essential truth that I also seem to read in Yoyos' poetry. Cyprus can at times seem to resemble a post-apocalyptic landscape in which we might re re recognize some familiar sights, but there is also a feeling of profound loss and dislocation. That sense of dislocation is there even in, in the apparent whimsy of the poem about the watermelon seller. Indeed, to some extent, to my ear, there is nothing whimsical about it. I find it terrifying, almost like some Buddhist nightmare of eternal reincarnation. Or to make another analogy, the narrator of the watermelon seller in Yoyos' poet poem might almost be a character from a Beckett play, again resembling shards of the pot who cannot or will not cling firmly to the whole. Or do I mean dislocated shards of the pot to which the whole will not cling? The kiosk. Down the street, a kiosk closed. It just shut down one day. One morning, it simply didn't open, like a tired man departs quietly and willfully for a one-way journey. The kiosk owners vanished. Friendly and decent fellows, we have never seen them again. We maybe never will. Now, every time I pass by, I glance at the remains of things abandoned inside the deserted store. I look at the shape of what has ceased to be, and I'm surprised to find it doesn't look at all like something absent. Life, when it goes away, leaves something behind. That thing lingers on, gathers like fluff on the body of time, and for a while it keeps death from expanding to where there used to be life. I sometimes wonder if I have a morbid disposition, a tendency to see the solitary cloud on a sunny day and predict it will rain. After all, in the kiosk, doesn't Yoyos give us a kind of hope? a feeling that something of life lingers on even after apparent death, a kind of trace memory of life. So why am I drawn so much to the first two-thirds of this poem, where the bafflement of uh, the sudden and inexplicable departure of the kiosk owners is so strong? As I say, it might be my own morose nature. But isn't it also that in the first part of that poem, we have the most human element, it is there we engage with the narrator's inability to comprehend what has happened to the kiosk owners, and we discover they were deep, friendly and decent fellows. To me, the trace element of life that lingers afterwards, like fluff on the body of time, sounds suspiciously like a sad and lonely ghost. But perhaps Yoyos doesn't see it in those terms. I think we're quite similar, insofar as we share a sense that that which seems whole is in reality on the edge of dissolution. Nothing is permanent, no matter how seemingly solid, no matter how good. But unlike my own temperament, in Yoyos' poetry, dissolution does not necessarily lead to complete disappearance or total loss. Often something remains, even if it's not quite in the form in which we might want it. In volumes. 
Just as the deceased are placed reverently in coffins, the coffins in morgue chambers, just as the pictures of the missing are hung on police stations, just as the skeletons of prehistoric animals are transferred to museums, so too do poems end up in volumes. Yoyos's poetic voice inhabits a world of chance encounters. In this, I think he's the inheritor of a tradition which started with the English romantic poets like William Wordsworth. Wordsworth's poetic voice travelled the Lakeland landscape of northern England and ran into various characters, from little children who believed their dead siblings still lived with them to a peddler who explained the reason for a cottage having been abandoned. In fact, I was reminded of Wordsworth's poem, The Ruined Cottage, when I first read Yoyos's The Kiosk. They are very different styles of verse, both of their times in a way, but they are linked by a sense of bafflement at the mystery of abandonment and by an underlying sense that humanity is threatened by unseen and inhuman forces that have the power to sweep away seemingly full and happy lives. A kiosk closes. What does it matter? A cottage is abandoned. What does that matter? Well, maybe it doesn't matter. Such small bits of life when set against the grand scheme of things. There's always another kiosk, always another cottage, always another pastelaki, gubes, or mahalapita peddler, Always another watermelon cellar. Always another wilderness on which no one has built a condominium. Always another beach on which rare turtles can nest. Always another until there isn't another. And you realise that unseen force, the deadly hand of human progress, has made our planet an inhuman wasteland. I think it's the shards of what was once whole and are now lost in that wasteland that Yoyo's narrator constantly encounters. Poetry is often about the ability to find salient metaphors for life in otherwise seemingly unremarkable things. Think of the devastating conclusion Philip Larkin drew about lost hope in something as simple as failing to toss an apple core into a rubbish bin. Yoyos is good at finding those metaphors too. The palm tree. As luck would have it, years ago I found a palm tree thrown away within my father's orchard barely the size of a child's open hand. No use planting it, he said. It's clearly a waste of time. And yet I bowed and picked it up. Now if you amble through my garden, you see a mighty palm tree casting its branches over the fence and singing all the while. So when they ask me of my kids, I say, I have five and one almost died. I do like those lines, casting its branches over the fence and singing all the while. Yes, trees do sing when they sway in the breeze, but it evokes much more than that. It evokes something joyous about life, especially about life so nearly lost. The tree sings because it's happy to be alive. Who said I was morose? It's this kind of metaphor-laden language that Yoyos uses so well. That does seem to be, I'm going to say, a Levantine or Mediterranean trait rather than a uniquely Cypriot one in which the mundane and the metaphorical meet. It's a trait most of us will know from the main, most famous book to be written in this region of the world, the Bible. But it imbues the wider Mediterranean and Levantine storytelling tradition too. I found it has become an integral part of my own writing practice, both as an art historian, where I suspect it has not gone down well in the often hidebound world of academia, and in my fiction writing, which has been enriched by it. I suppose that's another thing that makes me Cypriot, because, as Yoyos' writing also shows, I find Cyprus is a land that constantly gives you metaphors for life. Like the time I was driving from Larnaca to Paphos and I decided to leave the motorway at Yeruskipu to avoid going through the centre of town. On the road that runs through the flat farmland between the motorway and the sea, I saw an open-back pickup truck in front of me. In it stood a dog, a kind of pug, pug or French bulldog. It was surrounded by its puppies. But the dog was agitated, barking frantically. Yet the driver of the pickup truck just drove on. What he hadn't realised was that one of the dog's puppies had fallen out the back of the truck and was now running for its life along the road after its mother and siblings. Driving behind it, I slowed to a crawl and began flashing my lights furiously to get the truck driver's attention. Eventually, he did stop. He got out of the truck, saw what had happened, and when the puppy reached him, he picked it up, gave it an embrace, and put it back into the truck where it was welcomed by its relieved mother. The truck driver gave me a cheery wave as a thank you, got back in his vehicle, and drove away. 
Even at the time, that felt like the metaphor, a metaphor for something. I think it's that ability to see the symbolic, the metaphorical in the everyday, that is such a strong feature of Yoyos's writing. Senex Rex. Outside the house, next to the school, there sits an old man. He comes out at noon when the sun is shining on his crutches. He sinks into his shabby armchair like a weary king, takes in the sun, the agitation of giggles, feigns a smile, but seems bothered. He looks like a man at the end of his tether. I'm fixa fixated on him. There's nothing more interesting here. On days whipped by cold, he withdraws, retreats deep inside the house, to the kitchen perhaps, with an oil stove burning under the floor, in the secret lair of his youth. His wife closes the shutters tight and double locks the doors. Perhaps she thinks that death might think twice, and that with the next shaft of sunlight, the old man will rise again and reign in his court from his aged armchair. But death knows all his tropes. It's been a while since I last saw the old man reigning in his courtyard. How often, I wonder, will many of us here tonight have seen that old man sat outside a house or old shop somewhere in Cyprus, seated on his shabby armchair? When I read this, part of me, when I read this, part of me thinks of my own father, Senex Rex, and especially of my mother double locking the doors. It has the authenticity of the familiar, the almost mundane. There's nothing more interesting here, the narrator tells us. But the poem also transcends familiarity to become something metaphorical, a meditation on the passing of time, perhaps also on the way the world we inhabit seems to shrink and on the inevitability of death. Dare I say it, it's a kind of King Lear in miniature. But maybe I should end my talk in a tried and tested rhetorical fashion by returning to where I started, to the question of translation, to the question whether I might offend some people, translated poetry, translated people. There is a story that in the 1980s, when the British establishment was just beginning to recognize that Britain was a multicultural nation, a British government department decided to produce a guide in various languages other than English on how to register to vote in local elections. Because of the large Greek Cypriot community in Britain, one of those languages was Greek, and so a civil servant who said he was able to speak Greek was given the task of translating the complex set of instructions on how to get your name onto the electoral roll. Once complete, the translation was duly printed and distributed. But soon reports started to come back that there was a problem with the Greek guide. It was said none of the Greek speakers who requested it could understand a word of it. An investigation followed. And it was soon discovered that the civil servant who had made the translation could only read and write the ancient Greek he had learned at Oxford. <laughs> Perhaps from that we should acknowledge that even modern Greeks might be translations of the original. But of course no one wants to hear that because it's too easy to dismiss translation as a second best version of the original. But I think that's a very blinkered view. Sometimes translations can go beyond the original Take the British Empire. Whenever one thinks about the legacy of that empire, a legacy that is so often so negative, there is no denying the English culture that underpinned it, underpinned it was an astonishing thing. The civilization that gave us the colonial horror of the Amritsar massacre is the same civilization that gave us King Lear. But what I find more astonishing still is that the English culture that gave us King, King Lear is a culture built on translation and a very specific translation at that. It is built on the translation of the Bible into English by William Tyndale in 1536. Without that translation coming into being, it is hard to imagine English culture as we know it existing at all. The language of that translation, so beautiful and charged with additional meaning, was the engine that powered the work of almost all English writers who followed it, from William Shakespeare to T.S. Eliot and beyond. There's nothing second best about it. In fact, one of my favorite English poems is one I first learned at university, and it is a translation. Written by Thomas Wyatt in 1557, it is called Whoso List to Hunt, and it is a translation from an Italian original by Petrarch. Of course, there are now better translations of the Petrarch original, better in the sense that they are more accurate and no doubt more emblematic of Petrarch's original intentions, but none of them are to my mind 
as mournful and haunting as that by Wyatt. He too is not second best. And I, as a translated person, the product of two voices coming together, just like a translation, my English mother from Yorkshire and my Greek father from Cyprus, I also refuse to be called second best. If that's what you think I am, I don't care. Those who know me will be aware I've studied a great deal of the work of Herbert Reed over the years. Herbert Reed was a poet, novelist, art theorist, educationalist, anarchist, and more. He argued that to survive, human society needs art because the function of art is to reconcile the myriad of seemingly distinct and separate forces we encounter in life, and that through the ongoing and continual process of that reconciliation or hybridization, our understanding of reality is brought into existence. In other words, the shattered shards are reconciled. And I cannot help seeing the translation of poetry as something very like that. It's a kind of mystical union, a reconciliation between the poet and the translator. The product of that union might not be pure anymore. It might not be pedigree. But sometimes, to echo Georges' poem Smithereen again, it's more than the sum of its parts. And in that, I suppose, we might almost say a translation is the product of a marriage. It's the child of two parents. It is the offspring of the poet and the translator. I hope you will enjoy reading Yoyos' poetry as much as I have. As an art historian, I study paintings and sculptures and other works of visual arts in a great deal of detail. And this year is my 30th year working as a lecturer in higher education. So I've spent a great deal of time over these years talking about art and tried to give my, trying to give my best guess as to what it might mean. In all of that time, I've not had much, time, much opportunity to think long and hard about poetry, although it was my first love as an undergraduate student. So despite my initial trepidation in giving this talk, the process has been a welcome chance to do that. It will probably sound a bit trite for me to claim this, but I can honestly say I, can, I feel changed having spent so much time reading, rereading, and thinking about Yoyos's work, so much so that it has even entered my dreams on a number of occasions. I won't go into detail. <laughs> As I say, I feel changed by it, and that change is, I think, for the better. So I would like to thank Yoyos for writing these wonderful poems and Despina for translating them so beautifully. They're your children, and I think you have every reason to be proud of them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. That was a very fascinating and thought-provoking uh, reading of your work through a consideration of Cypriot identity, but also Cypriot diasporic identities. Um, but we hope that through the cultural activities that we organize here at the Cyprus High Commission, we actually invite and welcome our diaspora to connect and reconnect with their Cypriot heritage. So let's hope that uh, they are taking advantage of these opportunities offered. Ladies and gentlemen, Andreas Doe and Odd Jobs. Andreas Doe. We meet randomly, once or twice a year. Only yesterday he saw me at the supermarket picking tomatoes. And again he asked how my eldest daughter was. A son, Andreas, now a student. Right, right. Brief pause. Is he all right? Ah, oh, he's fine. The same chat each and every time over groceries gone bad. At the door of the name clipper. At the repair shop for replaced limbs. In the queues of dry jobless people. The pavements of the shrunken. The trenches of the city. Lean forward, Andres. No, don't take a bow, just lean forward. Strange how someone can always remember the wrong thing twice. I noticed a slight tremor in his hand, though skillfully he tried to hide it by gripping the shopping cart. I do my best to avoid him, but he persists in sharing his embarrassment. It's invincible. One day he dropped his head. We ran to catch it downhill. When I paid the next publisher to bring out my sixth book, I mailed it to an unknown address certain he would receive it somehow. Years later, we meet again in the public toilets, paying for a pee. Say, how's your daughter? I loved your poem about that guy. I can't believe that guy. Really, now, who is he?
Odd Jobs. And this one for Theodoros. My son works with metals, comes home with cuts and abrasions. He works as a waiter for tips withered by gazes. My son runs errands. The son inside him dies. My son harvests olive trees, his hands black with bitterness. He's a good boy, my son. Handsome. Everyone loves him. Sometimes he is summoned to other jobs. Sometimes he is summoned from the skies to act the angel, to haunt the wounded. And I think it's time to invite the author, Yorgos Christodoulidis, to the podium. Yorgos will talk about his work and also read one, of, uh, one poem from the collection in the original Greek version, Limni Tambo. Good evening, dear friends. Thank you all for being here. It's an honor for me and a pleasure at the same time. I've always felt it's better to let my poems speak for me, but uh, this is a special occasion, I guess. I have seen poems of mine translated before, but it is the first time such a wide selection of my work comes out in foreign language. In itself, this rereading puts my poems, especially those written 20, 25 years ago, to the test of time. And I don't only mean the past, but also the future. If present day poems can strike a chord with future readers, then I suppose that the poet is vindicated in a way. He's rescued along with his poems. The door to this edition opened thanks to my editor, Haris Ioannidis of Armida Publications, and to my gifted translator and wife. I approach these selected poems first as a reader, and only secondly as the poet who wrote them. I believe in the fluidity of art in the potential of a work art, whether it be a poem, a novel, or a painting, to become reinterpreted, remodeled, or enriched in the course of time. Yes, it may also be relocated in the sense of departing from its original intention, even more so when it sustains the complexities of translation. But, there is always movement in this process. There is always a sense of constant change that has kept humanity alive for so many centuries. I bring to mind the first Cypriot immigrants to the United Kingdom in the 1950s, 30s, their movement across. And I have this hope that their descendants will read this book as a way of picking up a long shared story. I strongly believe that everything comes to an end without even ceasing to exist. It carries on in the form of a sparkle or a particle of energy that enters the genes of the next generation of people and things. In fact, this is such a wonderful human ability to assimilate the rupture caused by an ending, to fashion it into a revived utterance. I write poetry in order to give voice to people and things whose voice was taken away from them, to acknowledge their silence as part of my own voice. I write because it enables me to make up a universe of shared symbols and codes, rearranged and transformed in tune with my own worldview. At this point, please allow me to read in Greek one of my poems where the merging of humans, trees, and animals is lifted off the bleak setting to suggest a new form of survival. The case of the word sembre in Lake Tambo. 
η περίπτωση της λέξης πάντα στη λίμνη Τάμπο. Ένα κέντρο κλαίει στις όχθες της παγωμένης λίμνης Τάμπο. Κοιτάζει απερπισμένα τη λίμνη και κλαίει. Από τα κλαδιά του στάζουν αναφιλητά. Ανατριχιάσματα σχηματίζονται στην επιφάνεια της λίμνης. Η λίμνη τα επιστρέφει ως ευμετάβλητους ανασασμούς λιγμών. Το κέντρο περισσότερο αναστατώνεται. Η λίμνη βουρκώνει. Οι πάγοι τρίζουν. Ένα κέντρο κλαίει στις όχθες της λίμνης Τάμπο. Επειδή κάποτε ήταν άνδρας που έχασε το φίλο του, το όνομά του. Αλλά είχε έρθει η ώρα οι άνθρωποι να μετατραπούν. Αφού πρώτα απολέσουν το φίλο τους, να γίνουν δέντρα, να γίνουν λίμνες, οι πιο σκληροί να γίνουν βουνοκορφές. Αυτοί με τις πιο αποπνιχτικές μελωδίες να λιώσουν μέσα στους ωκεανούς και πιο χοντρόπετσι υποστήλια και τυχώματα ορυχίων. Και κανείς πια δεν θα συναντά κανένα, αλλά και κανείς δεν θα μπορεί να βλάψει κανένα. Ούτε θα μπορούν σε περίοδους μεγάλης οδύνης να παρηγορούν ο ένας τον άλλο. Και την απώλεια του φίλου, για τη διαρροή της μορφής, όπως τώρα, το κέντρο που κλαίει, η λίμνη που θέλει, αν μπορεί να πλησιαστούν, με την αμετακίνητη λέξη πάντα ανάμεσά του. I am a journalist by profession. I have been trained to report, report the truth as clearly as possible. It is a useful profession when performed with humility and sincerity. I am also a poet fascinated with verbal illusions, the ability of words to transcend reality, to expand it. In between the two, journalist and poet, truth and illusion, I can hear the thought of words falling to the ground. But I have read and written poetry for many years, and I can tell you with certainty that the difference between a sentence and a verse is that as they fall, the sentence opens a parachute to land safely. The verse realizes it has wings to fly. Thank you all for being here. I'm deeply grateful. A great thanks to Yorgos Christodoulidis, Despina Pirketi, and Michael Paraskos, but also um, to the publisher, Haris Ioannidis. Um, you can get a, a copy of the book uh, from Haris. Um, I would also like to invite you to enjoy the impressive contemporary art exhibition that we currently host at the Cyprus House. It's entitled Phantom Yarns by Diana Taylor. Many thanks. Enjoy your evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening. It's um, nice to have you um, with us uh, tonight, and uh, it's our chance to find out about you because uh, I know you are a very um, uh, important, you know, person, and you are a Cypriot, and we don't know much about you. Do you mind giving us a little bit about yourself? You know, I mean, uh, you know, just uh, tell us a uh, few uh, things about your. Um, uh, past, uh, you know, uh, your family, and um, about um, your um, job you're doing? Yes, I, I don't really think of myself as an important person. I'm, uh, I'm a teacher, really. I'm a university teacher. I teach at uh, Imperial College London. Um, my father was the artist Stas Barascos, um, and um, my profession, if you like, is that I'm an art historian. So I write and talk and... Uh, lecture on art and art history to uh, undergraduate students, adult education students, anybody who will listen really. Yeah. What do you think about um, tonight's um, you know, um, uh, presentation of the book of uh, Yorgos Christodoulidis? Uh, I mean, in few words that we didn't hear from you. I think it's, it's a wonderful book of poetry. It's, it's got a haunting quality about it. Um, it's a kind of uh, poetry which is rooted in the everyday, so you recognize the, 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 the characters, you recognize the locations, 
but it then transcends that. So you suddenly are in this strange, metaphorical, almost mystical other world. So it, it's, I call it transcendent, but that sounds a little bit pompous. <laughs> so in your own words, I mean, um, uh, did you get the messages from uh, translation? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I suppose the question would be, you know, how can one tell if you've got the messages? But uh, I think the truth is I, I got an understanding of what poets are interested in. Poets are interested in telling us about how we live, the nature of life, the nature of the world we live in. And you certainly got that from the translation. I think Despina's translation is, is beautiful and I think it's, uh, it's, it's a real tribute to her uh, as well as to Yoyos that, uh, that the poetry really speaks to people. What is your relationship with uh, Cyprus? Uh, do you know about Cyprus? you visit Cyprus? Well, I used to visit a lot more when my father was alive, so I haven't been for a while, mainly due to COVID, so um, that, that's, that sort of stopped me going. Um, but uh, I've always had an interest in Cypriot art and Cypriot culture, Cypriot history. So although I teach here in England, I, 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 I talk a lot and have written a lot about Cypriot culture as well. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I've got... Um, I've got a love for the place. Uh, it's it's a kind of love-hate relationship for the place, but it, it is its love is in there as well. So I I, uh, I I I find the place is somewhere that keeps drawing me back, uh, even if sometimes it feels like it's perhaps pushing me away as well. How do you feel about the situation that the Cyprus is still occupied from uh, Turkish uh, government? But it's awful. I mean, uh, I mean, I think that goes without saying. I think. In a sense, you wonder whether you know, a response such as we're seeing now with uh, you know, Russia and Ukraine, if that, if that had happened in 1974 uh, with Turkey and sanctions, might the outcome be different now. Uh, but it's too late to worry about that. And, and I hope the two sides can get together and, and, and start talking because at the moment, um, it's, it's just been going on too long. Um, we, we, need, we need a solution. Um, so, I, you know, it's, a, it's an awful thing. Uh, as I think most people you know, would agree. Uh, I don't see what the solution is, um, but then it's not my job as an art historian to know what the solution is, but I just wish the politicians would find one. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about you are uh, the son of a very famous and uh, well-known uh, you know, uh, artist, uh, Stan Paraskos? Well, <laughs> it's... Um, it's, it's, it's one of those things which, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're always amazed um, because it, to me he was just dad, you know, you're always yeah, amazed yeah. when people think of him as, as this great figure. I mean, I love the paintings, I've got lots of them in my house. Um, but, uh, you know, to me he was my father and like anybody, any son, you know, I see him in those, those, those terms. So, yes, I mean, he's, he's, he, I know his history is fascinating, I know his art is, is, is important. Uh, and significant both in terms of, of art history in, in Cyprus but also in Britain. Um, but uh, to me, he's, he's always going to be my dad. <laughs> That's how I see him. <laughs> Thank you very much for talking to us. My pleasure. Kalispera Georgi Pali. Moris Echide Yoshi, Parusiasi Du Ivliu. Pos Estanes? Estanome Mia. Πραγματική χαρά, διότι ε, ένιωσα ότι ε, όσοι παρευρέθηκαν σε αυτή την εκδήλωση και δεν ήταν λίγοι, με έκπληξη μου είδα πάρα πολύ κόσμο, ε, το έκαναν επειδή πρώτα απ' όλα τους ενδιαφέρει η ποιήση και δεύτερον τους ενδιαφέρει η επικοινωνία ενδεχομένως με την ποιήση μου ή η δυνατότητα να μάθουν κάποια πράγματα για την ποιήση μου. Είμαι ιδιαίτερα ευγνώμων τόσο σε όσους προσήλθαν για να παραστούν, αλλά και ιδιαίτερα στους συντελεστές της εκδήλωσης. Θα ήθελα να ευχαριστήσω τον υπάτο αρμοστή μας, τον κύριο Κακουρί, τον Μάριο τον Ψαρά, που ήταν η ψυχή της εκδήλωσης, τον Μάικολ Παράσχο, ο οποίος έκανε μια καταπληκτική ομιλία, η οποία θα πρέπει να διαβαστεί Πιστεύω, όχι επειδή μίλησε για την ποιήση μου, αλλά έστειλε κάποια πάρα πολύ αληθινά μηνύματα ναι. ε, και προς την Κύπρο ε, και προς την Ομογένεια και νομίζω ότι η ομιλία του ήταν πάρα πολύ σημαντική. 
Ε, επίσης, να ευχαριστήσω τη μεταφράστρια, μεταφράστρια μου, τη Δέσποι, να βρίσκεται χωρίς αυτή, αυτή η εκδήλωση ε, δεν θα μπορούσε να γίνει, διότι θα υπήρχε το ε, βιβλίο και γενικά όλους όσους συνέβαλα στο ε, να γίνει αυτή η εξαιρετική βραδιά ε, στην καρδιά του Λονδίνου, μια γέφυρα που μεταφέρει ε, ε, ένα ψήγμα της κυπριακής λογοτεχνίας εδώ σε αυτή τη σημαντική πόλη. Διαβάζοντα τα ποιήματα σου τώρα, Γιώργο, ε, νιώθεις ότι ε, τα μηνύματα στέλνονται ακριβώς όπως τα φαντάστηκες, όπως τα ένιωσες και όπως τα εκφράστηκες στην ελληνική γλώσσα. Ε, θα έλεγα ότι στέλνονται με τρόπο που δεν θα μπορούσα καν να φανταστώ. Υπερβαίνει της φαντασίας μου. Όταν έγραφα αυτά τα ποιήματα, πότε δεν φανταζόμουν ότι θα έτυχαναν μετάφρασης και παρουσίαση στο Λονδίνο. Απλώς ήθελα να βάλω μέσα σε αυτά τα ποιήματα ένα κομμάτι του τι είμαι εγώ και του πώς βλέπω τα πράγματα. Η εξέλιξη των πραγμάτων είναι εντελώς εκτός του δικού μου ελέγχου και των δικών μου δυνάμειων και μπορώ όμως να πω ότι την απολαμβάνω. Ναι. Τώρα τι γίνεται, γράφουμε, συνεχίζεις να γράφεις, ποια είναι τα μελλοντικά σχέδια σου. Ένας ποιητής ποτέ δεν σταματά να γράφει, όχι επειδή το επιδιώκει, αλλά επειδή ε, έτσι είναι η κατάσταση. Ε, η ποιήση, δόξα τω Θεώ, ε, εξακολουθεί να με επισκέπτεται και ε, παρά τις πάρα πολλές υποχρεώσεις που, που επιβάλλονται στο, σε έναν άνθρωπο ο οποίος έχει οικογένεια, επαγγελματικέ υποχρεώσεις κτλ. Ε, η ποιήση παραμένει, θα έλεγα, ένα μέρος πάρα πολύ σημαντικό για μένα και ελπίζω να συνεχίσει να με τιμά και να με επισκέπτεται. Σε περιευχαριστούμε που μας μίλησες, που ήσουν εδώ και μας έδωσες την ευκαιρία να σε γνωρίσουμε καλύτερα και εύχομαι κάθε επιτυχία στα μελλοντικά σου χέρια. Εγώ σας ευχαριστώ για την προβολή που δώσατε τόσο στην εκδήλωση αλλά και με τη συνέντευξη που κάναμε και σας είμαι ειλικρινά ευγνώμων και σας εύχομαι ό,τι καλύτερο στο έργο σας. Ευχαριστώ πολύ Γιώργο. Έχουμε και την Έσπιν Επικετή εδώ, η οποία έκανε τη μετάφραση του βιβλίου του Γιώργου Χριστοδουλίνη στην απόψινή εκδήλωση, η οποία νομίζω ότι ήταν ε, επιτυχημένη εκδήλωση. Πώς νιώθεις, Έσπινα? Νιώθω πολύ συγκινημένη, διότι είδα κόσμο, είδα ανθρώπους, πολύ αγαπημένα πρόσωπα που έχω ξαναδεί, που βλέπω κάθε φορά που έρχομαι στο Λονδίνο, αλλά και άλλους ε, ανθρώπους που ήρθαν έτσι ειδικά να παρακολουθήσουν την ε, ε, βραδιά ε, γνώρισα επίσης μεταφραστές διότι δεν είναι μόνο οι ποιητές ναι, 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 ναι. που ήρθαν εδώ ήρθαν και ναι, μεταφραστές ναι, ναι. Ναι, που είναι πολύ σημαντικό για μας πολύ σημαντικό με την έννοια ότι η μετάφραση όπως είπα που με άκουσες δεν είναι, είναι κάτι που όλοι κάνουμε δηλαδή μεταφράζουμε όταν μας μιλά κάποιος μεταφράζουμε αυτό που μας λέει μέσα στο μυαλό μας το ερμηνεύουμε ε, άρα έχω την εντύπωση ότι μας αφορά όλους Λοιπόν, ε, είδα ότι είχατε καλούς συντελεστές της αποψήνης εκδήλωση και πιο συγκεκριμένα με ενθουσίασε η παρουσία και η ανάλυση των ποιημάτων του Γιώργου από τον ε, Παράσχο. Μάλιστα, ναι. Ο Μάικχολ, ναι, έκανε μία... Κι εγώ έχω πραγματικά ήταν διαφωτιστική ομιλία. Με ποια έννοια περνά μέσα από την δική του την εμπειρία η ποιήση του Γιώργου. Δηλαδή, να σου πω κάτι απλό, τα τέσσερα, τρία, τέσσερα ποιήματα που επέλεξε να διαβάσει είναι αυτά που ε, περιγράφουν καθημερινές στιγμές, αλλά μεταφορικά. Το ότι ε, λειτουργούν μεταφορικά σημαίνει αυτόματα ότι ο καθένας μπορεί να τα ερμηνεύσει με το δικό του τρόπο. Δηλαδή, η μεταφορά δεν είναι κάτι παγιωμένο, Αναλύωτο. Είναι κάτι που περνά μέσα από τη δική μας εμπειρία. Άρα το να γράφεις ποιήση, να μεταφράζεις ποιήση και να, την, να ακούς ε, πώς αυτό το πράγμα ε, περνά μέσα από τη συνείδηση και την εμπειρία ενός άλλου ανθρώπου είναι, είναι φοβερή, ε, φοβερό χάρι, φο, όχι χάρισμα, φοβερό δώρο Δω. που, που εισπράττεις. Ακριβώς. Λοιπόν, ε, μια και είμαστε εδώ απόψε, έχουμε την ευκαιρία να πούμε και κάποια άλλα πράγματα που είμαι σίγουρος ότι ενδιαφέρουν και εμένα και τους αγαπητούς τηλεθεατές γιατί παρακολουθούν τακτικά 
την ε, σειρά του Ρίκ χάλκινα χρόνια. Ναι. Λοιπόν, και βλέπουμε έτσι μια σειρά η οποία είναι μεν ε, βασισμένη πάνω στο παρελθόν, ε, αλλά όμως έχει και πιο μοντέρνα πράγματα και υπάρχουν κάποια πράγματα τα οποία ενθουσιάζουν τους τηλεθεατές και βλέπω πολλούς έρωτε να εξελίσσονται. Λοιπόν, <laughs> είσαι μία από τους ε, σενεριογράφους. Ναι, Πες ναι. μου λίγα λόγια έτσι, πώς αισθάνεσαι, πώς νιώθεις που είσαι μέλος αυτής της ε, παραγωγής. Μεγάλη χαρά, μεγάλη τύχη, που, διότι είναι μια πολύ καλή ομάδα. Η Σοφία Σοφοκλέου, ο Γιάννη ο Κόκκινο, εγώ, με υποπτήρια ανεπιμέλεια σεναρίου τη Κόρινα τη Αβραμίδη. Ε, είναι όντω. Ε, έχει δίκιο. Υπάρχει η μοντέρνα ματιά. Γίνεται καθαρά για λόγου μυθοπλασία, για να κρατάμε το ενδιαφέρον. Δηλαδή, δεν έχει νόημα το να περιγράφει τη ζωή πέντε ανθρώπων που είναι ευτυχισμένοι και όλα πηγαίνουν καλά στη ζωή του. Ε, δεν έχει κανένα νόημα. Άρα, ε, όντω, κάποιε φορέ πρέπει να εκμοντερνιστούν λίγο, τουλάχιστον ε, η, τα συναισθήματα. Διότι είμαι σίγουρη, και εγώ και οι άλλοι δύο σεναριογράφοι, ότι ερμηνεύουμε τα, τα, ό,τι του συμβαίνει, ό,τι συμβαίνει στου χαρακτήρε μέσα από την μοντέρνα ματιά, ακριβώ για να έχουμε Ακριβώς. αυτό που είπε πριν, το ενδιαφέρον, να κινούμε το ενδιαφέρον του κόσμου. Ελπίζω να μην ε, το παρακάνουμε. Εντάξει, προσπαθούμε να μένουμε μέσα στα πλαίσια ε, τα επιτρεπτά. Ναι, ναι ε, κοίταξε, η δική μου η άποψη είναι αυτή. Δεν είναι μια σειρά η οποία βασίζεται μόνο πάνω σε, και το είπα και προηγουμένω, πάνω στην ε, ε, πραγματικότητα. Ναι, Αλλά υπάρχει πολλή μυθοπλασία ναι. και υπάρχουν και πάρα πολλοί έρωτε. Λοιπόν, ναι. θέλω να μάθω και εγώ και οι τηλεθεατέ, γιατί κάποιοι μου ρωτούσαν ποιο θα είναι ο επόμενο εραστή τη Θάλια, παραδείγματο. Θα σου το πω μόνο με έτσι μυστικά, μυστικά, να μην το πεις σε κανένα. Εκτός από όλους τους Εντάξει. Εντάξει. Εκτός από όλους. Εντάξει. Η Θάλια θα γυρίσει στον πρώτο της έρωτα, που ήταν ο, 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 ο πατέρας του παιδιού της. Α, Αυτή είναι η... Έτσι. Ναι, αλλά μην το πεις. Ναι, μην, το... μην το πείτε κανένα. Όχι, όχι. Ναι. Έλα σου πω, mm. γιατί δεν δείχνουμε τα παιδάκια, δεν υπάρχουν οι ηθοποιοί. Όχι, αυτό, υπάρχουν οι ηθοποιοί, αλλά λόγω των μέτρων για το COVID είχαν, ναι, είχαν πει πολλέ παράμετροι ε, απαγορευτικέ για να έρθουν τα μωρά. Οπότε, ε, νομίζω όμω ότι τώρα στα επεισόδια που γυρίζονται τώρα και θα προβληθούν Απρίλιο-Μάιο, ε, επιστρέφουν. Έχουμε εμφανίσει και των παιδιών. Ναι, πιο... ναι, διότι είδα στα προηγούμενα επεισόδια, παλιά επεισόδια, ναι. είδα και το γιο σου. Ναι, ωραίστη. Ωραίστη. Ε, θα επιστρέψει ίσως... Ε, όχι, όχι, διότι κοίταξε να δεις, <laughs> να σου πω Βασίλη μου, όταν άρχισε να παίζει ήταν περίπου ως εδώ και τώρα είναι έτσι, Α, οπότε ίδιο. τι ναι. να το... Έχει... Κρατήσαμε τα μικρά τα μωρά όμως, τα μωρά του, το παιδί, το παιδί του Σωτηρκά, ε, τον Νικολίν και το παιδί του Τζόουνς και της Θάλιας, τον Σεμπάστια. Ε, αυτά θα ναι, επανέρχονται, τα μωρά του τα θα επανέλθουν. Ναι. Πώς μπορεί κάποιος να, να αναγνωρίσει, γιατί είναι δύσκολο να αναγνωρίσει κάποιος από πού προέρχονται, από ποιος είναι ο σενεργογράφος κάθε επεισοδίου, ας πούμε. Είναι πολύ δύσκολο. Προσπαθώ να εντοπίσω έτσι, κάποια επεισόδια για να πω, α, αυτά η δέσποι να τα γράφει, ας πούμε, είναι ο κόκκινο ή ξέρω εγώ, ναι. και δεν μπορώ. Ε, σου, με το χέρι στην καρδιά σου λέω ότι και εγώ κάποτε δυσκολεύομαι, επειδή περνά καιρό από την... Ε, Πε ότι γράφουμε εμεί τα επεισόδια Δεκέμβρη, και μπορεί να προβληθούν δύο μήνε μετά. Άρα, κι εγώ ξεχνάω κάποτε όταν βλέπω τα επεισόδια να προβάλλονται, σκέφτομαι τώρα τούτον είναι εγώ που το έγραψα, είναι η Σοφία, είναι ο Γιάννη. σω επειδή, όπω σου είπα, την επιμέλεια την κάνει η Κόρινα η Αβραμίδου, ότι υπάρχει μια ομοιομορφία, α πούμε, ε, στι φωνέ. Ε, δηλαδή, η πλοκή μπορεί να διαφοροποιείται, αλλά προσπαθούμε όσο πιο πολλά μπορούμε να υπάρχει ομοιομορφία στις φωνές. Ωραία. Άρα είναι λίγο δύσκολο να καταλάβεις ποιος γράφει τι. Ωραία. Ε. Λοιπόν, τώρα, ε, μελλοντικά σχέδια υπάρχουν, έχεις κάτι στο Σκαρί, έχεις κάτι, προγραμματίζεις κάτι. Γράφω ένα θεατρικό, είμαι τώρα στα... που είναι μαύρη κομμωδία, τα έχουμε ξαναπεί. Ε, εντάξει, είναι ακόμη όμως, ε, όχι στο αρχικό στάδιο, είμαι περίπου στη μέση ας πούμε. Θα είναι σιγά σιγά, τρέχει ταυτόχρονα με άλλες αναλήψεις μεταφραστικές. Οπότε υπολογίζω ότι μέσα στον επόμενο χρόνο θα, θα τελειώσει. Πού κινείται αυτή η κομμωδία, δηλαδή, τι... Έτσι, για λί... Με λίγα λόγια έτσι είναι, πέρα. Ε, η αφορμή είναι ένα, μια πρόσκληση σε ένα δείπνο όπου οι, οι μισοί γνωρίζονται μεταξύ τους και οι άλλοι μισοί όχι 
και δημιουργούνται διάφορα έτσι ευτράπελα. Υπάρχει μια κοινή, ένα κοινό νήμα όμω για να συνδέει του χαρακτήρε μεταξύ του. Ε, νομίζω ότι η μαύρη κομμωδία το, έτσι, το αποδίδει πιο εύστοχα ο, ο όρο. Κινείται σε αυτά τα πλαίσια. Μάλιστα. Ναι. Λοιπόν. Ξέρω ότι σου αρέσει. Ναι, ε, γι' αυτό μου αρέσει η μαύρη κομμωδία και θα ήμουν ευτυχή ε, αν ήταν ε, περίπτωση και. Πάλι να ξανασυγκαστούμε στο μέλλον. Ε, και, και εμένα θα ήταν, διότι ήμουν πολύ χαρούμενη και πολύ συγκινημένη όταν σκηνοθέτησε στο Σόμερφιουρ. Είδα και τη Βασούλα τώρα ναι, ναι, ναι. που ήταν στην εκδήλωση με μεγάλη χαρά. Ε, οπότε θα ήταν και τιμή και χαρά να συνεργαστούμε ξανά. Βέβαια. Σε υπερευχαριστούμε ε, που ήρθε εδώ και μα έδωσε την ευκαιρία και εσύ και ο Γιώργο να χαρούμε αυτή την ποιήση που γράφει ο Γιώργο. Διαφορετικά δεν θα μπορούσαμε να. Πάρουμε αυτά τα μηνύματα δίχως αυτή την κρύλωση. Εντάξει, το πήρα το Ιουλίο, το διαβάζω και το μελετάω αναλυτικά. Ε, συγχαρητήρια και σε σένα για την μετάφραση και στο Γιώργο και εύχομαι κάθε επιτυχία στα πληροτικά σας σχέδια. Ευχαριστώ Βασίλη μου, ευχαριστώ και σε σένα κάθε επιτυχία. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Έχουμε μαζί, λοιπόν, έχουμε μαζί μας λοιπόν τον Δόκτωρο Μάριο Ψαρά. Καλησπέρα, Δόκτωρο Ψαρά. Τι κάνετε. Καλησπέρα, Βασίλη. Σας ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ που είστε σήμερα μαζί μας. Α, σας καλωσορίζουμε στο σπίτι της Κύπρου ε, και το ονομάζουμε σπίτι της Κύπρου γιατί ακριβώς α, θέλουμε να είναι ανοιχτό προς την ομογένεια, προς την κοινότητά μας, να έρχεται να το νιώθει σαν το σπίτι της. Ε, είναι ένα μέρος που θέλουμε να νιώθουν ότι εδώ επανασυνδέονται με την Κύπρο. Γι' αυτό και προσπαθούμε να κάνουμε συνέχεια εκδηλώσεις που έχουν να κάνουν με τον κυπριακό πολιτισμό, με τους, με τους κύπριους καλλιτέχνες μας, τόσο αυτούς που βρίσκονται στην Κύπρο και τώρα μετά την πανδημία καταφέρνουμε σιγά σιγά να τους φέρνουμε εδώ, αλλά επίσης και με τους κύπριους της ομογένειας, τους καλλιτέχνες μας που εδράζονται εδώ. Πολύ ωραία. Λοιπόν, αυτό νιώσαμε απόψε εμείς εδώ στην παρουσίαση του βιβλίου του Γιώργου Χριστοδουλίδη σε μία μετάφραση της Δέσποινας Πικετή με 100 ποίηματα, επιλεγμένα ποίηματα από τις συλλογές του Γιώργου του Χριστοδουλίδη. Ε, ήταν μια πολύ ενδιαφέρουσα περίπτωση η οποία μας ε, έδωσε την ευκαιρία να νιώσουμε αυτό που είπες. Δηλαδή την, να νιώσουμε ότι βρισκόμαστε σε ένα σπίτι που ανοίγει στην Κύπρο και ταυτόχρονα ότι γίνεται μία σύνδεση μεταξύ το, της παρικίας των παρήκων και των καλλιτεχνών της Κύπρου και της παρικίας. Αυτό ακριβώς είναι που προσδοκούμε και εμείς. Γι' αυτό ε, θέλουμε όλο και, περισσότερους, ε, όλο και περισσότερα μέλη της ομογένειας μας, της κοινότητάς μας, ε, να έρχονται στο κεντρικό Λονδίνο και να συμμετέχουν στις εκδηλώσεις μας, γιατί στο κάτω-κάτω για αυτούς τις κάνουμε. Ε, οπότε θέλουμε να έρχονται εδώ, να γνωρίζουν ε, τους καλλιτέχνες μας, τους ποιητέ μας, τους λογοτέχνες μας και να... Να κάνουν ε, reconnect, να επανασυνδέονται με τις ρίζες τους. Ακριβώς. Τώρα, να μας μιλήσει και λίγο για αυτή την πολύ ενδιαφέρουσα έκθεση που έχετε εδώ, που φιλοξενείτε. Πες μας λίγα λόγια για αυτή την έκθεση. Είναι μια εντυπωσιακή έκθεση. Έχει τίτλο Phantom Yarns και είναι από την Βρετανοκύπρια καλλιτέχνη Diana Taylor. Ε, σε επιμέλεια της ε, Κύπριας ε, επιμελήτριας και κριτική, κριτ, κριτικού τέχνης ε, Μαρίας Στάθη. Αυτή είναι μια έκθεση η οποία ε, είχε εγκαινιαστεί πρώτα στο, στη Λευκοσία, ε, νομίζω, αν δεν κάνω λάθος, το Σεπτέμβριο. Ε, οπότε ε, καταφέραμε να την μεταφέρουμε, παρόλες τις δυσκολίες το, της εποχής, καταφέραμε να την μεταφέρουμε εδώ στο Λονδίνο α, και μάλιστα να την εμπλουτίσουμε, γιατί η Diana Taylor εδράζεται στο Λονδίνο, είναι κομμάτι της ομογένειας, της κοινότητάς μας, α, και έτσι να την εμπλουτίσουμε και με άλλα έργα της Diana α, που είχε στο στούτιό τη. Οπότε είναι μια έκθεση ε, αντιπροσωπευτική της δουλειάς της Diana Taylor, η οποία όπως θα έχετε καταλάβει ασχολείται ε, με, πάρα, πο, με πάρα, πολλές, δια, πάρα πολύ διαφορετικές τεχνικές. So, ε, 
κυρίως ασχολείται με το κολάζ, αλλά αυτό το κολάζ μπορεί να έχει μέσα, α, βλέπω τις σημειώσεις μου εδώ, μπορεί να έχει μέσα ζωγραφική, screen printing, κέντιμα, 3D scanning, α, είναι μια σύνδεση αναλογικών και ψηφιακών μορφών τέχνης που, που συνδυάζει το παραδοσιακό, μπορείτε να βρείτε και, θα μπορείτε να προσέξετε να διακρίνετε κάποιες τεχνικές από τα παραδοσιακά κεντήματα, τα λευκαρίτικα yeah. κτλ. Της, της Κύπρου με σύγχρονες ε, ψηφιακές μορφές ε, τέχνης. Είναι αυτό που από ό,τι αντιλαμβάνομαι ασχολείσαι και εσύ πιο πολύ. Δηλαδή αυτό σε πολύ ενδιαφέρει αυτή η σύγχρονη με την Ακριβώς. συνδυσμένη. Ακριβώς. Μας ενδιαφέρει πάρα πολύ να, να βρίσκουμε καλλιτέχνες οι οποίοι ε, ασχολούνται με την παράδοση μας, αλλά με ένα σύγχρονο βλέμμα. Ανανεώνουν την παράδοση μας και δείχνουν ότι η παράδοση μας έχει θέση στο σήμερα. Αυτό είναι το σημαντικό. Να μην νιώθουμε ότι η παράδοση μας είναι κάτι με το οποίο εμείς δεν έχουμε καμία σχέση και με το οποίο είναι απλά κάτι του παρελθόντος. Είναι πολύ σημαντικό να καταλάβουμε ότι η παράδοση είναι, κάτι, είναι ένα οργανικό, ένα ζωντανό πλάσμα το οποίο αναπτύσσεται, το οποίο, αναπτύσσεται, το οποίο ε, είναι, είναι μέρος του DNA μας. Αναπτύσσεται και μεταλλάσσεται. Ακριβώς. Όπως και εμείς. Και εμείς. Αναπτυσσόμαστε, αλλάζουμε. Λοιπόν, δόκτωρ Ψαράς, τι έχουμε στο μέλλον, στο εγγύς μέλλον. Στο εγγύς μέλλον, 27 του Απρίλη, έχουμε στο Ελληνικό Κέντρο Φιλολογικό Μνημόσυνο του ποιητή και κριτικού Δημήτρη Θήτα Γκότση, που είναι ο πατέρας του γενικού πρόξενου, του Θεόδωρου Γκότση. Και μετά ακολουθούν, θα έχουμε το In Short Europe Film Festival. Θα είναι μια συνδιοργάνωση όλων των Ινστιτούτων και των πρεσβειών των χωρών της Ευρωπαϊκής Ένωσης. Οπότε είναι το δίκτυο Unique London, στο οποίο φέτος είμαι πρόεδρος. Και είναι το δίκτυο των EU Culture Attaché. Και διοργανώνουμε το φεστιβάλ In Short Europe. Είναι στις 7 Μαΐου, Σάββατο, στο Γαλλικό Ινστιτούτο, στο Kensington. Και είναι ένα απίστευτα ωραίο φεστιβάλ με ταινίε μικρού μήκου από όλη την Ευρώπη. Κάθε, χώρο, κάθε χώρα εκπροσωπείται με μια ταινία. Εμείς εκπροσωπούμαστε με την ταινία ε, A Summer Place ε, της Αλεξάνδρας Ματθαίου. Και μετά θα έχουμε πάλι καινούργιες εκθέσεις, συμμετοχή στο, στο Cypriot Wine Festival με μια φωτογραφική έκθεση σε συνεργασία με το ε, Cyprus Center at the University of Westminster. Ε, μετά έχουμε ένα, ε, μια συναυλία μέσα Ιουνίου και μετά μέσα στο τέλη Ιουνίου, αρχές Ιουλίου έχουμε ετοιμάσουμε πολύ μεγάλα πράγματα, πολύ καινούργια πράγματα. Ε, θα έχουμε μια σύγχρονη ε, εντελώς ψηφιακή VR-AR έκθεση εδώ ε, σε συνεργασία με το Βρετανικό Πανεπιστήμιο, ε, sorry, με το Βρετανικό Μουσείο και το Ερευνητικό Κέντρο Science στην Κύπρο. Είναι η έκθεση ε, του Μιχάλη Χαραλάμπους Άνιμα. Και μέσα στον Ιούλη θα έχουμε μια συνεργασία με το Royal Holloway Center for Greek Diaspora Studies και το Fitzwilliam Museum και θα, είναι, θα έχει τίτλο Creating Diasporic Worlds και είναι εξ ολοκλήρου αφιερωμένη στη Διασπορά. Πάρα πολύ ενδιαφέροντα όλα αυτά και είμαι σίγουρος ότι έχουμε την ευκαιρία να τα ξαναπούμε έτσι πιο αναλυτικά. Βεβαίως. Εμείς σας περιμένουμε εδώ πάντα το σπίτι της Κύπρου είναι ανοιχτό. Ευχαριστούμε πολύ.